everyone. Welcome to Stars in the House. I'm Andrea Burns. So glad that you could be with us. It's June 8th, and I am honored to say that the inimitable Seth Rudesky and the indefatigable James Wesley, who began bringing you, count them, 16 shows a week at the beginning of the shelter in place in March, raising over $350,000 for the Actors Fund, have entrusted me now with Monday Nights. So I am your weekly guest host and will be kicking off Andrea Mondays with a fantastic show tonight. But first, I wanted to share with you that I, among others, am feeling a lot of things. A seismic shift is taking place and there is tumult everywhere. And though I do to all of the violence, I also feel awake and hopeful and hopeful that we can make the world a better place to live in. Um, also, it's real to feel awkward and clumsy about how to help right now. Um, I just wanted to share with you, part of my desire to be on Broadway was to stand next to people whose talents made the earth rattle for me. And now as a member of that community, again and again, I feel so lucky to work with such extraordinary talents and skin color and cultural background being a piece of the great identity of these magnificent artists. Our Broadway community has an essential opportunity for growth at this time and no one is on the sidelines. We all have to go back to school on this. I have pledged to educate myself and to practice active listening right now. Uh, I just wanted to quote one of my favorite speakers, Brene Brown, who says, empathy has no script. There's no right way to do it and there's no wrong way to do it. It's simply listening, holding space, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly powerful message that you are not alone. Meanwhile, isn't that what theater artists have always been called to do? To hold diverse human experiences up to humanity as a mirror so that empathy can lead the way to the healing of the world? Broadway, we have some work to do and I look forward to doing it with you. Now, as some of you regular viewers know, last week, Stars in the House shifted its giving from the Actors Fund to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. It's America's premier legal organization fighting for racial justice. Through litigation, advocacy, and public education, LDF seeks structural changes to expand democracy, eliminate disparities, and achieve racial justice in a society that fulfills the promise of equality for all Americans. So you can donate tonight at starsinthehouse.com and we'll be reading the names of the donors towards the end of the show. So if you wanna shout out, once you donate at starsinthehouse.com, you'll be sent a receipt back. Take that receipt and forward it to starsinthehouse2020 at gmail.com. If you forward that receipt to Stars in the House 2020, then we'll be able to give you a little shout out uh, during the show. So tonight, I'm really excited you guys because I actually get to share with you a group of artists that truly rattle the earth for me. They are a shining jewel in the Broadway community and so many of us know and love them and revere them but for those of you who maybe haven't met them yet, I'm gonna roll a clip introducing you to the Broadway inspirational voices led by Tony Award winner, Michael McElroy. I grew up in a very sheltered environment, so I didn't know anything about HIV or AIDS or the epidemic that was ravaging the theater community until I moved here in 1991. I experienced having my first friend and castmate ravaged by this disease and pass away. And it was not a singular story. As theater people do, we rally together. In 1994, I asked 12 of my friends to come together as a benefit for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. We did a night of gospel music in a church on the Upper West Side. It was just the thing that our community needed. And from 1994, it became an annual event. 
We've been really fortunate to be at this crossroad of what we do, which is the gospel music, but we're also theater artists who are able to and required to kind of switch musical styles at will. So that has given us the opportunity to take part in many different events. If I go back to the first top event, it would have to be Upsell 2000. <laughs> And Opsail 2000 was an event that was in the New York Harbor. And on one of the ships, they were going to do a concert. We had the opportunity to perform for President and Mrs. Clinton at that time. So that was the first, like, big, amazing thing that we did. Since then, we've performed on the Tony Awards three times. The first time with Rosie O'Donnell, who was a huge fan of the choir. We performed again in their in memoriam section and then the last time with Sting when his show The Last Ship was on Broadway. Other highlights include singing with Vanessa Williams on the Miss America pageant, performing with Hugh Jackman on the Today Show. We've done PBS specials with Billy Porter, with Janine Tesori, live from Lincoln Center, with the Yeah Yeah Yeahs on the David Letterman Show, then sing with Elton John. We sang with Jason Mraz at Radio City Music Hall. We sang Broadway Salutes Barack Obama when he was a senator. So we've been able to use our talents in many different arenas with many different types of artists, which speaks to the membership and their ability to transform. So we've been really lucky to do some really amazing and exciting things. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, Please welcome the artistic founder of the BIV, someone I admire so deeply as an artist, as a human being, as an educator and friend. Please welcome Michael McElroy. Hello. Hi, Michael. Yeah, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. These, yeah. Are, <laughs> these are interesting times for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, I'm so thrilled to be lifting up Broadway inspirational voices tonight. I've been a longtime fan, and um, I want to talk about the origins of the choir um, because, of course, many of us, before you even got started, know you as a fantastic actor. Um, in fact, um, you were Tony nominated for your role as Jim in this amazing Deaf West production of Big River, um, in which um, it was an American, correct me if I'm wrong, American Sign Language adaptation mm -hmm. using deaf hearing actors and hard of hearing actors. Yes. Okay, you guys, so amazing. So besides being a triple threat, he was a quadruple threat, mm -hmm. um, adding American Sign Language to his skills. We're gonna roll a clip of Michael as Jim in Big River. Yay! Um, that's so amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> it takes me back. Does it take you back? I had the pleasure of watching you do that live on Broadway. It was incredible, but I must say, you in particular just blew me away, blew me away uh, in that production. What was that like? Ooh. Um, it was interesting because um, my agent would always call me when there were regional productions of Big River um, around the country, and I always said no. Um, because I just was at a place in my life where I just couldn't handle certain language. And, you know, when we're actors, we have to be able to do what the show demands of us and then leave it at the theater when we leave, right? Yeah. And there's certain things that are harder to let go of. And I knew I wasn't in a place where I could. And so when this one came around, my agent was like, just listen. <laughs> it was like, it's half, uh, it's, it's uh, deaf actors and hearing actors. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So just the fact that this slave uh, uh, did sign language, American Sign Language, automatically cracked it open in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Calhoun was very open to exploring and allowing me to question things and come up with choices that would be something I would think would give uh, Jim more dignity and um, deepen the character for me. So he wasn't, you know, so I didn't feel like I was sacrificing something. I felt like I was adding something uh, to the character. And 
you know, you just never know. We do what we do because we love to do it. And and then you look back at back on it and you go, I did that. And I was a part of something that was really special and unique. And uh, for some, I think it's our anniversary of something I just saw on uh, Facebook. Someone wow. had um, something from the Tonys when they when they did the little montage on the Tonys. Wow. Someone just posted it today. So it was really an amazing experience. It was great. Fantastic. Um, we definitely, I just remember left such an impression on my heart, um, seeing everybody come together. And again, theater artists are so magical. It transcends all languages. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought that was extraordinary. So meanwhile, you're Tony nominated. You're doing really well in your career. Why do you decide Broadway needs a gospel choir? What is What, what was that all about? Um, well, when I got here in 1990, um, from, I went to Carnegie Mellon and I um, got here from a very sheltered background, as I said in the video, but I didn't know anything about HIV. I didn't know anything about AIDS. I didn't know anything about any of that. And then to be plopped into New York City, into the theater community, right at the height of that time. Absolutely. You know, young people today don't have that context. You know, at that time, it was not a medicine or a pill you could take. And so it, you really watched your friends here one moment and the next day gone. And you know, like all artists, we rally and we fight and we raise money and we do what needs to be done. That's one of the most amazing things about the theater community that I love. Um, but there wasn't anything that was really speaking to the heart, to the spirit, to that part of you that could not reconcile what was happening um, to our community and to people that we loved and worked with and friends. And so I grew up in church. I grew up with this incredible music uh, legacy uh, from you know playing the piano in church, singing in church. My, my mom plays, she still plays every Sunday uh, at 80 years old. And, um, and I knew how much this music meant to me. I knew how much this music healed me. Um, and so I wanted to bring it to our theater community. So I asked like 11 friends and we did an evening of gospel music as a benefit for Broadway Cares. And um, the response was, amazing, it was overwhelming because we created a space that was diverse, that welcomed people who had been, who carried some hurts around being accepted in certain spaces mm. and a welcoming space for everybody. And people had an opportunity to come and to laugh and to grieve and to cry and to celebrate in their way, in an environment that was inclusive and um, celebrated everybody. So that was the first year. That's gorgeous. I have a question for you about that um, because something that uh, for the people who don't know, something that BIV does that's so incredible is you take theater music and Michael himself does these unbelievable gospel arrangements of show tunes that we already know and love. So that first concert that you're talking about with the 12 people, was it straight up gospel music or was it uh, was it show tunes in, in gospel arrangements that you did? It was oh, so the type of that's my uh, darling Eliseo. You know him as the Pirata uh, guy from yeah. In the Heights singing yeah. with him. Yeah, that's yeah. my um, um, <laughs> The first year, the first few years, it was all gospel. But we always did musical theater things because we were invited to do other events. And um, it wasn't until, I think it was Telly. I, I had done a piece with Billy where we took Sondheim music and did like gospel pop and James Sampliner um, yeah. arrangements called Being Alive. And then it really wasn't until Telly said, let's do something with this. And we did a concert and that's when I really started writing and arranging and pulling songs and uh, creating gospel pop, R&B arrangements, jazz arrangements of Broadway uh, musicals. And then I started going into like what's currently on Broadway and trying to use those as well. Amazing. Can I tell you like a dirty little secret about like BIV in the early years about me? I think it was 1996 because it was the year I was married. This is how I know this. Um, I actually was part of the BIV, uh, well, when it was called Broadway Gospel Choir. And um, uh, I'll, first of all, I will never forget mm -hmm. in that room with all of those voices. And at the time you had commissioned uh, Jason Robert Brown to write an arrangement. And it was so incredible to be in such a diverse room and you had white actors, black actors, Asian actors, and then you had Jason get up and teach everybody an arrangement where everyone had to sing in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. And it was, um, it's called Sanders. It was so stunning and something I will remember for the rest of my life. Um, subsequently, I broke my leg in Beauty and the Beast and had to drop out of like all things. So I never got to be part of that concert. And mm -hmm. 
cut to 25 years later at your big gala that I was so honored to speak at. Um, someone said to me like, how do you, what's your history with BIV? And because I'd just broken my ankle a few months before. Oh no. And I was there, there I am speaking, but I don't have my actual, my cane that was with me at the time. And I just didn't want to say like, I was in it and I broke my leg and now I'm here and I broke my foot. So anyway. <laughs> But didn't you sing? Did you sing with Billy when we sang at Town Hall? Did yes, I did. I will yeah. never forget that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we sang He Shall Purify and a whole bunch yeah. of other things. So yeah. I have experienced the the oh the incredible surge of energy and um and emergence uh, and energy and uh joy in mm -hmm. that in that music. Um so what I want to do now is actually roll a clip of uh, the performance at the 25th anniversary gala um, of a song that you may know and love. Uh, and uh, I don't know, yeah, I think you'll just recognize it when we start, but this is this is your arrangement, Michael? Yeah, yeah, I did it and uh, Isaac Carlin did the orchestration. Okay, so here we are. This is the B.I.V. singing a show tune you know and love. Let's roll the clip. So if you Oh my God. So to me, for those of you who've just seen that, can you even believe it? Okay. And secondly, like that, I see that we were preparing the clip for today. Not only do I get chills, but I get so moved because I feel like, isn't that what we do at its best? Mm -hmm. You've got theater artists so full of the spirit, so wanting to give you everything they've got right and then you have an audience that is like yes it doesn't even know what to give back i was you know privileged enough to be in that audience that night we were just screaming back um so grateful to receive that so um tell me a little bit about um deciding to do a song from wicked and and how did you even come up with that um it's interesting um the songs usually choose me <laughs> because I'm trying to choose what songs and I'm thinking about it. And then I'll be listening to, you know, I always either listen to gospel music or musical theater. I'm such a musical theater geek. And um, so if I'm at the gym, when when I used to be at the gym on elliptical, I'll always play musical theater uh, sound, uh, scores. And um, I don't know why I was thinking about Defying Gravity, but I wanted to do something by Stephen Schwartz. I knew I wanted to, to feature something from one of his shows. And I was leaning towards A Beautiful City, but I was like, oh, but well, that's been done, you know? And I thought, what would be the hardest song I could choose? <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, and I was gonna do For Good, uh, what is it? The, um, yeah, For Good. For Good. And then I was like, no, that's, we have enough ballads. I need to do something up tempo. And then it was just, how do I figure out what the feel is? Exactly. And once I understand what the feel is, then it can pretty much write itself. But I got to right. figure out what that groove is. The way you found yourself in musically to me is just one of the most thrilling. It's, it's, you know, I mean, it just so shows what a gifted artist you are and the way your brain can incorporate obviously all the influences, all the genres that has met, have meant something to you and somehow funnel them into something that we can receive um, oh, so joyfully. So I just thank you for that. Love it so much. So as you were doing it, here's my question. When did you know it got bigger than you ever thought it would? When did you know it was bigger than just wanting to get some friends together? You know, it was already a beast of its own that was starting to become bigger than even the initial vision. Hmm. 
You know, I never, if you told me, and I say this all the time, if you told me 25 years ago that this is where I'd be, I would have told you you were an idiot or, or just there's just no possible way. I would have been terrified to do it because for me, it was, I just saw a need and I grew up in an environment because my family, my stepfather was a minister, my grandfather started the church. I just grew up in an environment that valued service. And I look at being an artist as being service. We right. give something, we touch people. We don't know what they're going through. And in that time that they come into that theater or whatever, we are in some way touching them, affecting them. Agreed. You know, and so I just saw the need. And, you know, because my focus was on just filling that need in the only way I knew how, it just started to grow. And every year, first year was 11, then it was 21, then it was 36, before I knew it, we were at 65. And then I went back down to 25, and then we grew again. Um, and opportunities to perform with such incredible people and, and incredible events just kept coming. I didn't search for them, but in the DNA of the, of the choir as an organization is that idea of diverse voices coming together, mm. um, of giving back. For us as actors, so much of what we use our talent for is to make a living. And sometimes that can leave patches in your spirit, I'll say. You know what I mean? BIP for me fills those holes for people, right? Because you're just doing it for the sake of the joy. It, it kind of helps you recapture that feeling of when you first learn to love it, right? Yes. Right? Where your worth and you're getting a job is not in someone else's hands. Your ability to do it sometimes is always in someone else's power um, in certain ways. Um, and so for us, it's an opportunity to come together and just sing and to lift our voices and to give back to the world that we're living in something that we think will be healing. Yes. And, and it brings me back personally to mm -hmm. the first time I felt that kind of, you know, group unity, group love in elementary school chorus, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm someone who loved singing in the chorus. I love harmony. It's mm -hmm. like the greatest joy of my life to be mm -hmm. in an ensemble show that is arranged with a lot of harmony. To me, it's like, yeah, it's it's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. And uh, I just love that that takes me back. And certainly anybody watching um, BIV can, who love chorus, whether you're like a theater person or not a theater person, you remember that feeling in chorus, lifting voices together and, and the impact it had not only on the audience, but on you, right? Yeah. Um, so you do this and 25 years later, <laughs> you're suddenly receiving the Tony Award honors for excellence in the theater. Um, you know, what is that? What does that even feel like? David, uh, our wonderful tech director, here we go. We got a picture. Here's Michael at the Tony Awards and, and receiving his Tony Award. Look at that. Um, what? I mean, your mind must have been so blown. What was that like? And did 25 years go by in a flash? Yeah, uh, they do go by in a flash. And um, <laughs> it was an interesting time because personally at that time, and I talk about this sometimes with friends, and it was a pretty difficult, challenging time personally at that time. Um, and it was so funny because I was in such a place of conflict and grappling with so many personal things last year at that time. And literally on the day that I was like, oh, this is just can't get any harder. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just one of those months, you know, and I'm usually a kind of, I can rally and I just couldn't rally because of some things that were happening. And, um, and I was on the phone and my, the, our accountant called and said, you need to call this number. I'm like, what is it about? Just call. So I called the number and it was a woman's voicemail and she, and I left my name and number and she called me back. And it was, uh, from the American theater wing, uh, thing that, Probably the spiritual voices have been given a, a special Tony honor for excellence in theater. And um, I just started crying. And I'm, you know, as I got older, I'm such a crier now. I never used to cry. Like it, it takes nothing. <laughs> and I'm in a public do, Don't you think that it's like because you really do feel how long you've been working, how far you've come? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can, you can sit there, you're doing the grind and you're, you're 
developing the choir and it's 25 years and you're, you know, like that lady is turning, turning, turning through the years. Like it just keeps going. And then one day you're looking at the fruits of your labor and saying, oh my gosh, I did that. Like that was a long time. Mm -hmm. you, I don't know at this age, I'm feeling that too. You actually are able to step back and say, whoa, I put in some real time and who even knew, who could have even thought this far ahead? Yeah. And it yeah. was a bigger dream than you even imagined. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. It's that, that, you're exactly right. And being at this point in my life, it's like not only looking back and going, wow, what a gift. And I mean, and I and I, when I say gift, I mean not just the great things, I mean the really horrible, crappy things. <laughs> in the times of real, as uh, Angela Robinson, who's in the choir, says, valley of preparation times. Ooh. Where, you know what I mean? Where Ooh, that's good. You know what I mean? Because you need those moments sometimes to kind of shed some skin or or grapple with some things so that when you come back up to the other side, you see it in a different way, you experience it in a different way. And so what it is looking back on it, I'm always like a just keep going. <laughs> Be present, but you know, on. keep going. And what it has done for me is really look back and appreciate, but also be a little bit more intentional about where I'm going. And you know, how many years I have left of kicking this leg up or whatever, or singing this song or whatever. And I wanna make sure that I'm intentional about the things that I do um, and try to make a difference in every possible way. Beautiful, well, you're doing it. You're certainly doing it. And, um, and there's a big outreach component of BIV that I wanna talk about, but we'll do that when we bring our guests on. For now, um, I wondered if you'd give us the incredible treat of, uh, of sharing a song with us. Obviously here at Stars in the House, we like to have a little music. And, you know, this is one of my favorite voices in the world, I gotta just tell you. So for me, it's an extra special treat to hear Michael sing tonight. Um, so I will leave it to you, sir. Mwah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. <laughs> There was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy. They say he wandered very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. And then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. And as we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. The greatest gift you ever learn is just to love. And be loved in return. 
Oh, thank you. Why you gotta be so good? Uh, so good. Uh, God, that was gorgeous. Thank you so much. Thank you. For sharing your, your heart and your unbelievable skill and talent uh, with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, so my darling, I thought we'd bring on some um, dear friends of ours and wonderful friends of BIV to join mm -hmm. in the conversation and share with us um, their experiences with BIV. So um, please welcome to the studio, uh, Ms. Renee Elise Goldsbury. Woo! Hi. Woo! Uh, Telly Woo. Leon. Hi. And, uh, and stars in the house favorite, Norm Lewis. Yay. Hey. How do you get favorite? Well, Renee, <laughs> Renee is a stars in the house favorite too because she's been doing a lot of plays in the house uh, too. Um, thank you guys for coming. Welcome. My heart is so full of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I just wanted to take this, you know, so many of uh, everybody knows you in the world for your own individual careers and may not know how you are and you got started with BIV, how important it is to you. So I just wanted to start, um, Renee, would you tell me about like your history with BIV, how you got started with them? Hey, don't tell I... that story. Oh, what story? <laughs> now you gotta tell that story. Times. So many times. Um, <laughs> I, um, I went to college. Well, when I went to college, Michael was a professor there at no. University. <laughs> and, um, I was a senior and she was a freshman. He singled me out. He heard me sing my freshman year. <laughs> and he singled me out and he said, I, he forgets this part. He forgets this part when he tells about the, like, the inspiration to create BIV. He forgets, he forgets seeing me perform freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be truthful. The opposite is actually true. I did go to Carnegie Mellon with with uh, Michael. Um, he was out the door, so he didn't have much time for me. Um, and maybe about seven, 10, 15 years into my life in New York, I still couldn't get his attention. But eventually, eventually we were in rent together, right? Yes. I was in a dressing room next to him, and um, he finally, I finally wore him down, and he invited me to be a member of Broadway Inspirational Voices. And I used to be offended because I feel like I'm so spiritual. I just didn't understand why he went trying to get <laughs> um, But he finally, you know, the world got to a place where he felt like he needed me to be crying in their soprano section. <laughs> <laughs> not getting any notes out and so that's kind of what happened but it's uh it's a blessing because you know you know I, the closer you are he's like the sun the closer you are to him um the the more you just kind of benefit from you know that light that he has um he really just you know it's a, it's a gift to actually the choir members and to the world and mm -hmm. we're um you know he just puts he puts he kind of gets, you know, he's pretty much feeding us as he's giving us an outlet to feed the world. It's really a blessing. So I'm, I'm grateful that he keeps us close. Mm. Um, Finally. I can't believe you were in that. So you were Carnegie Mellon too. I think like all the most talented people were there at that time because That's Michael. So true. That's so true. Billy Porter, Emily Skinner, Natasha mm -hmm. Diaz, mm -hmm. Todd Taylor. I'm just thinking about all of the people I admire that were part of that world that at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Crazy. Um, Norm. Yes, hi. Tell us a little bit about BIV, your beginnings with BIV. I've, you been, love them. I've been asking Michael to join BIV for the longest time. And he's <laughs> I just come to all the concerts. So that's my connection. No, I'm lying. Um, no, I uh, I think it was the second year. Was it the second year? It was the second year. We, uh, Michael and I were doing Tommy on Broadway, and he recruited me for the gospel choir. I had not uh, known about it the year before, and I was just so honored to be a part of this group. And what I, I was listening to the interview before, the thing about gospel music, it's so, there's so much passion behind it, and it does reach the soul, no matter who and what you believe in. So that's why it worked. There were people who were not, you know, Jesus is not their main source, but they were singing about Jesus, and they were touching, it was touching their heart. It was touching the audience's heart. But, uh, yeah, I, I got lucky enough to be a part of the group, like, in the second year, and it's a safe haven. It's a home. Uh, Michael is tough. He wants you to be on point because you 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 got to be on point. <laughs> I heard a story. Oh, finish. Yeah, no, no, but, uh, but, yeah, I'm sure you've heard many stories, but the thing about it, 
it's a good, it's a tough love. And that's the main thing. And you feel, like I said, you feel like home. Uh, and on the, to piggyback what you were talking about, I just remember the first couple of lines. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh Adonai. And that's all I remember. But uh, it was beautiful. Right? It's like that cut me too. I could have sung it for you too. Those moments just get imprinted on you forever. Yeah. Right? That is incredible. Um, Michael, I heard a story about you. And I don't even know if maybe you told me the story about your sister who also um, led the choir. Is, am I right about this? Well, she leads our choir. She, I grew up, my, she played for our youth choir and directed the youth choir back home. And she sings in the choir now. She's been singing with us since the second year. But is it her or you that would be leading the choir and when she heard someone slightly off would just be like, you, out? <laughs> <laughs> that was more my sister, but I, I always know where it's coming from usually. You know, it just, it just, you know. It's one of these. It's one of these. It's like, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. No, someone's wrong. Someone's wrong. <laughs> they make fun of my finger because I'm always pointing. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. but that's how you get that kind of excellence. I mean, you guys, there's, it's untouchable, the sounds uh, the group makes. Telly, tell me how you became involved with the IV. Well, I, I'm just, I'm the super fanboy. I'm like, I am i am that fanboy of, of this choir. I've heard about this choir. I too went to Carnegie Mellon um, and I had heard legends of this, legends of the, legends of that, that group that came before me that, um, that uh, and of course of this amazing choir of Broadway's best voices. And so I got, I went, gosh, who, who are they? And then finally I got to meet Michael. We, we got to do Rent together. Me, Michael and Renee all did Rent together. Uh, we were the final company. And, um, and I, I'm, I really am, I'm just a fanboy. My first time singing with the choir was actually at the gala for the 25th anniversary it was the first time. I, oh, there's, my, there's my, my castmate from Aladdin, Courtney Reed. Courtney um, Reed. We got to do this great arrangement of, of A Whole New World uh, that, that Michael had arranged for Broadway Our Way, for the Broadway Our Way series. And I, I you know, um, I love Michael. He's one of my dearest friends. And um, what I appreciate about Michael being his friend and also being a supporter of BIV is that word rally, I think is, is, is the right word for Michael because I think Michael finds a really wonderful way to rally people together. But wh whatever it is, whether it's a cause, whether it's bringing music you know, to, to underserved communities, whether it's just bringing people together at a time where spirits need to be lifted. He has a, and, or just being his friend or just rallying a group of friends together. He's just really good at that. It's, it's, um, it's a talent and a skill in itself. So I was, I got rallied, I got rallied in. It's been fun. It's been fun. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, the picture that we showed was of you with Courtney That's Reed, who was Princess Jasmine in Aladdin. And uh, coincidentally, she was also Carla in the Heights with me um, nice. for a little while. So that was a big thrill to see you guys singing that together. Um, talking about the 25th anniversary gala, there was a really moving point of that where uh, Renee sang with uh, somebody who had uh, a member, somebody who had been through the program through Covenant House. Can mm -hmm. we talk a little bit about that? Um, you see this yes. picture here? Michael, do you, do you know her? Yeah, um, I met her that night um, and she, uh, she's a resident, was a resident, had moved through the passage, uh, Rites of Passage program, and is now out actually performing as an artist and uh, was always very talented, but it was through our program there that we really cultivated and supported her talent. And she moved out into the world and is now working and has come back and has been a guest artist, teaching artist for our, our program, Covenant House uh, Songs in the Key of Me program that we did this year, so. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, she, um they, they, they told me that I was introducing somebody and that the song was for her. Um, and, uh, but I didn't know until I was listening to her introduction live that she was a singer. And then she sang, remember? Like she, yes. I mean, I she was a singer, I should say. I didn't know that she was gonna just take an opportunity to sing on the microphone um, and be so awesome. And so then I was, it was like, well, I'm gonna sit up here and sing this song to you. You know what I mean? I just feel like this is inappropriate. And um, so I kind of put her on the spot and she was so, I mean, like if I was her age and somebody had put a microphone in my face for a song I did not know, I would have so I know. It was terrible. Like I felt really bad about it, but I just, something in my heart told me that she would do, she would kind of take the opportunity. She just seems, 
she just seems brave and, you know, brave in that way. And I was right. Like she was just, you know, she heard it one time and she started improv along and I was like, okay. Uh, they, well, um, and, and you handle an that honor. beautifully too, because you happen to have this beautiful heart, Renee. And so I remember just watching you straddle the line of, Join in if you want. I'm here if you want to, <laughs> right? And um, and then she jumped in, and it was just it was a really moving part of the of the evening. So how does it work? Uh, tell us a little bit about your work with Covenant House, Michael, and how that works. Well, we have two uh, programs. The program is called Songs in the Key of Me, where we match either teaching artists or composers at Ronald McDonald House with uh, children who are battling pediatric cancer. And we usually use Broadway musical theater composers and we match them. They meet a couple different times and then the composers go away and write a song. And then we usually have a concert at the house with all the families for the children um, where we introduce the songs and celebrate the lives of these children. Um, and we finished our 40th song last year for their 40th anniversary of Ronald McDonald House New York. Um, this year we're doing it a little differently because of the pandemic, so we're making, doing the same thing, but doing them as music videos that'll have video releases at the house uh, with everyone. And then we have the same program, Songs in the Key of Me, at Covenant House, where we have a, a monthly program called VIV at the Cub, where we do anything, it's a monthly program, someone from our, our program uh, led by Angela Groby shows up, and it's either like vision boarding or uh, songwriting or poetry slam or learn the choreography from in, uh, from in the Heights. I mean, it's, it's pain and everything they want, but we just want them to know that no matter what, we are always there for them and we will be there, we will show up for them. So many of these kids are homeless or have been trafficked and to have adults who say, we're gonna be there for you um, is important to us. And so we have that, that happens all year. And then we have writing time for their gala. We uh, do the songs in the Key of Me uh, program which matches a teaching artist with someone in the house who has musical skills and they write a piece together that's then performed at the gala. And this year, because we're in virtual land, uh, we actually reached out to a bunch of different covenant houses around the country and used uh, um, and worked with students, uh, residents who um, were at the different uh, uh, covenant houses and created two wonderful songs using all their you know, talent playing the cello and bass and singing and writing. It was a really incredible experience. It's incredible. Music is so healing. I mean, in the end, it's just such an incredible unifier. Um, so, Norm, last night, actually, I tuned into the Phantom episode of Stars in the House. You were fabulous. And, um, and you had some really uplifting words for us at the end about how, in the middle of all of what's going on right now, that it is a time that we can actually start to look towards hope. And um, because the choir, the, the part of the mission statement of the choir is, um, forgive me if I this, hope transpire, no, trans, hope inspire. And, right. Um, how can we, and, and Michael too, like how can we, what is BIV, um, how can we look to them to lift us up during these times and, and, um, how can I also send more people to listen to that? Well, I mean, there's always, uh, thank God for virtual, uh, you know, you can see YouTube and things like that, but there's also uh, albums, Christmas albums and other other recordings that are out there and working with other artists. But, you know, the thing about uh, the choir and the thing about Michael is that it's deeper than just the surface of performing. I mean, performing is, is important and all that stuff, but then what's behind that? And then you, you just talked about Covenant House and and Ronald McDonald House and uh, all of the outreach. And that's what it's all about. That the, the performing part is the door opening, but then you get in there and then you give the message. And that message is of hope and exactly what the mission statement says. And I feel like at this time, especially because, you know, we've been saying these things as a culture and a people for so long. And, uh, you know, and someone in other interviews I've had, it, someone said that it's, it's like Groundhog's Day, you know, because, it's been, you know, there's been these peaks and these valleys of about equality and justice, but then it kind of sits dormant for a while, then it goes up again and it comes back down. Right now, I see a major shift because everybody in the world is saying Black Lives Matter. That is unprecedented. Everybody, you know, uh, people in Japan, where there might be one or two black folks, <laughs> but they're saying Black Lives Matter. 
and I, I can't breathe, things like that. So it's such a unification. There is still that, that faction out there that's trying to push it down. But I feel like the, right now is, is the, there's a shift that's happening that's so positive. I agree. And um, of course, all of the all of the the guts of what's in the music um, is built on all of the giving that you give. But dare I say, you feel it just listening to it, yeah. not even knowing everything, all of the giving that goes in, all of the work that you've done in community service and honoring people and, and lifting diverse people up. Um, it's reflected in the music. I feel like as an audience member, I feel it physically, uh, that that reaching out, that embrace, that joy and that hope. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I, go ahead, Tony, go ahead, Tony. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with any, I didn't grow up in a religious home. I didn't grow up as a Christian or anything, but I remember going to my first BIV concert and, and, and it didn't matter in a lot of ways that that, mu that that music spoke to me in a way where it, it didn't matter what what background or what religion I came from or lack of religion that I came from for for a minute we all had this shared experience and it was just about it was just about feeling your humanity it was about feeling all all of the feelings that you're supposed to feel no matter what faith you followed and so I I don't know I think if we're going to get anywhere in this world uh, we have to have music I think that's and we have to have that shared experience of music if we're gonna if we're gonna move together as a society. I was um, so, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. No, I was just gonna say that um, I what what I was gonna do for the reading that Peter had asked me to do. I, um, I've been reading a lot of this over and over. This quote by Toni Morrison, and she wrote this back in two thousand and four. Um, and it's I'm only gonna read this one section over. But this is what I, why I think art is important. She says. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. I know the world is bruised and bleeding and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom like art uh. and that has been the thing that I've gone, you know, when I wanted to kind of go, oh, that's the thing. I know that what we do as artists, you know, matters. I know even more, you know, you know we're taking advantage of all these social platforms and, and technology, but what I've learned more than just the curiosity and joy of getting to use it to still reach people, what it has revealed to me more than anything else is that nothing ever will replace the live experience. There is something about the exchange of human energy in that theater, in that space that cannot be replicated and cannot be replaced. And I look forward to that day when we get back to that. In the meantime, let's celebrate and do all we can. Let's raise money, let's keep going, but we can never abandon the art. We gotta keep singing, we gotta get keep producing something, getting it out there. Maybe this is the time when you're planting seeds for something for the future. But I challenge my students and I say, don't let this time just be a time where you succumb to our negative energy around you. Activate in some way, whether that's writing in your journal or writing a song or, or anything, but just keep that artistic energy flowing so that when it's time to put it out into the world, it's there for you. <laughs> it's essential and we need it now more than ever. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because um, this is a time as black people, a lot of people are reaching out to us, you know, to say a whole variety of things. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, but I think, you know, there's an idea, you know, if you're not black, that you're reaching out and that you're, you know, to say some form of I'm sorry, or I feel what you're feeling, or I know this must be hard. If you call me and you ask how I'm doing, I'm like, good. You're like, I, oh, really? Because I know, you know, like, like we're in, and it's not that we don't have pain, but for me, um, when I look at the last couple of months, the difference between how I felt, you know, when we were dealing with COVID-19 as an artist was like, you know, we were hiding. Right now, I have something to do, right? There's a call that actually, you know, that, that's more than just, this is what I'm doing in my house, guys, you know? Right. That, um, a, a call for something that I've been screaming and crying about all this time, but everyone listens now, everyone, everyone wants to join in now, and, um, and so I feel actually better. I feel, you know, I mean, there's pain and rage inside, but the, the artist in me 
um, is hopeful and activated. And I'm so grateful for that quote, Michael, because it really speaks to what I needed right now mm -hmm. to um, to direct, you know, um, you know, kind of pain, rage, frustration, um, you know, all of those things. The, the artist in me is what what heals all of that. And I and I just to piggyback on that, I feel like that uh, sometimes the universe, God, whoever you believe in, puts a, a, a particular soul in your life. And close your ears, Michael. But this is that person. Michael is that person. He, speaking of art, he has so many talents that he kind of doesn't know what to do. Because <laughs> he can sing his ass off. He's a good looking guy. He can act, he can dance, he can teach, he can arrange music and so, it's it's wonderful to have someone like him to kind of guide us and lead us and and especially in this this particular arena so i just want to you guys who are listening to this or seeing this you don't know what a treat it was tonight to hear him sing i know he does not do that he doesn't do that he likes to be in the background he's very shy let me tell you why he doesn't do it because yeah, huh? all i wanted to do when i came on this thing was to say i love you oh i love you in return <laughs> I love you in return. <laughs> you know, he really, <laughs> yep. really, and he's yeah. and, and he's got he's he's holding in his hands the, these kids at NYU. He's teaching, you know, he he's is. giving that gift, and you know, it's just amazing. It, it really is amazing. So uh, I just have to give you public mm. accolades. I love you. You're my brother, mm. and I'm here for you anytime you need. Um, I agree. I, I think we all breathe a different kind of air around Michael. I do. This is why I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and I'm so thrilled and honored that all of you joined us. Um, apparently, his his song did a uh, moved a lot of hearts today. I have some donations to read. Um, Woohoo! Woo we have uh, Sydney, one hundred dollars. Yes. Um, Thank you, Sydney. Marcella from North Carolina, uh, five dollars. Thank yes. you. Five. Thank you. Uh, Jan from Colorado, $50 yeah, in yeah. honor of Norm Lewis, my hero. How about that? Yeah, that's better than you did at the auction, Norm. <laughs> <laughs> so, Norm, send Jan from Colorado some love because she loves you. Don't like you. Don't like you. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Danielle, $25. And... Um, Susan and Emily, $100. Thanks for doing this. So glad to support. Yeah. So I'm so thrilled. That's going to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. We're so honored to be here tonight. And, and again, I must thank you all. Um, I also want to say that when I asked Michael, I said, you know, I want to have a panel of, of people around. Um, certainly people tune into Stars in the House to see some of their favorite Broadway performers, but I want people you really love and trust around you. And he asked for you guys, and I have to say to the people in the audience, I put that call out and they jumped. Um, <laughs> it was such a testament to Michael. Even Norm, who was on last night, said, I'll be there. Um, so I just want to thank you all. If I could ask you, one word to come up with that encapsulates the feeling of either being on stage with BIV or being in the audience to receive the gifts of BIV, uh, what would that be? Wow. That's so, there's so many words to choose from. I know. Um, dynamic. You're saying the, uh, the, the word for how it feels to be there with that group? Yes. Like, for me, I'll say it's electric. Yeah. Dynamic is for me. I'm going to stay with my word that I gave before, which is rally, because it is pretty amazing to rally that, that amount of people together to sing as one like that. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Oh, that's so hard. You know, I got a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know you do. No. You give three to I'm like, holy ghost, what's the word? <laughs> I, you know, I have to just say, and I'm gonna come up with a better one when we when I leave the meeting. But um, humbled, really humbled, um, just because uh, you know that's that's what happens to you when you receive a gift 
that is, you know, more greater than really, I think what you feel you deserve or really ask for. I mean, that it's, 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 uh, it's just humbling to stand. I mean, like what you see and when you look at this man that I will cry if I'm glad that I can't really see him because my glasses aren't on. Um, <laughs> You know, that that's, you know, he's surrounded by um, an entire choir of people that are as awesome as he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, these are people and you know, we're we've been around a minute now. We've had our teeth are we got some long teeth up in there. Like we've been around. <laughs> how, dare um, how dare you. And the beauty is, you know, like the the these are people that just get getting better and better and better and better and better. And he's been able to I mean, he's constantly finding ways to use them in greater ways to do bigger and bigger things like it's, it's offspring now. And to be around them in any capacity, it's just, it's just humbling. And it's, uh, it's something that, you know, we, we can never find enough words to say thank you for. Michael. Oh, um, I would have to say whole. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about that experience, like I said, that fills in empty spaces that we carry when you walk into a space that for some have been told that they're not welcome there because of who they are um, or not welcome because they don't look a certain way or aren't a certain race or a certain background. And what I love about it is that the audience, the, the choir that you see on stage looks just like what you see in the audience. And it's a, it replaces those gaps, those holes in our, and people will leave there feeling like, okay, I'm exhausted, but everybody was like, okay, I feel <laughs> and I can move forward with something filled up in me. Like what was on my tank was on empty and now it's filled up again. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I have to say that all of you make that me feel that way as artists. I admire you all so much. And and we, yes. you, we, you. Yes. 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 Love you. And my, I mean, and I'm, my I'm, I'm also an Andrea Burns fan, fanboy because I, I saw you do Parade when I was in, in Carnegie Mellon. Oh my God. And, you, and, you, you, came, and you came, yes, you came through the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. Yes, you did. Uh, Jason conducted, Jason Robert Brown conducted the tour. Yes. And, and this Carnegie Mellon senior was geeking out, like geeking out. Like, you know, I'm here. Thank I'm you. Sure. I'm thinking out that you're Carnegie Mellon now too, because apparently that's where I'll be. Thinking. I think I'm a Carnegie Mellon honorary. <laughs> uh, Andrea, <laughs> Andrea, you and Norm and I didn't we sing the demo for Parade? Um, uh, I know Norm and I did because I have the recording. Yeah, I, Andrea, were you there? I know it was Jenny Gearing and and I think uh, it was Anastasia, you, Andrea. Anastasia. I, don't, Anastasia no. I know the Norm and I, I did. The demo for that, but just like fun fact, I don't know if you guys were part of this, but. Do you remember, maybe you were part of this, Michael, that there was sort of a race to who was going to win the composing spot for Ragtime and everyone had to submit an opening number. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I sang for one team, that's what I'll say. But uh -huh. it's cool, yeah. Did Sorry. the team win? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it was an incredible number. But that's what I'm saying. There were so many of those really cool demos and projects we were all doing back in the day yes. uh, together. And um, I'm just so honored to know you all. I'm such a fan from the audience and and my heart is full of you. Thank you so much for making the time tonight. I Thanks. wanna say one oh. thing before you go, one thing before you go, there's two things Ooh. I wanna tell the people, go and listen to Let It Sing from Vibe, Ooh. the original album, Let It Sing. Michael Ooh. Gilroy put his stamp on that. Also, while you were showing the footage of Defying Gravity and also while we were there at the- Ooh, there yeah. you go. There you go. <laughs> There's Michael as the original flick in Violet. Violet let, it, uh, yeah. let it sing, it really will touch your heart. But I was thinking as of watching that footage and being at that 25th anniversary, there should be some producers out there. Listen, producers, this could be a Broadway show and it could inspire a lot of people. It could be all kinds of things where it could be a jukebox musical or whatever but it's the Broadway Inspirational Voices on Broadway, in a Broadway house. I'm just saying, oh, cool. let's get this going. And the charts are done, so, you charts know. Are done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a fantastic idea. Bring Broadway Inspirational Voices to Broadway, stat. Mm. All right, love you guys. Thank you very much. Yes, next up, Broadway kids. Yeah, and keep donating. Thank you to the people who donated. Keep Thank donating. Thank you so much. Thank you.
keep donating and thank you. Thank you for being on, guys. Love you. Love you. Too. Love you. Love you. Look at this. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Love you, Michael. Thank I love you. you more. I'll see you soon. I'll see you next week. Okay. Can't wait. I love you. you. So much to Michael McElroy, Norm Lewis, Renee Elise Goldsbury, and Telly Leong, uh, and the Broadway inspirational voices for sparking joy. Um, I hope this has inspired you to hope and look for a better tomorrow and figure out how you can take action. Um, I always end my shows with a little musical message. Um, and so tonight's is basically about how I feel now and the hope I have for the healing of the world. Something has changed within me. Something is not the same. I'm through with playing by the rules of someone else's game. Too late for second guessing. Too late to go back to sleep. It's time to trust my instincts, close my eyes and leave. It's time to try defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity and you can't pull me down. Nobody is all alone for no reason that there is a bus inside the camera.